Good morning, convening the Tuesday, September 14th hearing for the House Investigative Committee to investigate compliance with audit numbers 19-12 and 21-01. Welcome members, noting the presence of uh, myself, Chair Bulati, Representatives Tarnas, Hashem, Kobayashi, and Peruso via Zoom camera. In addition, we, I believe, have Representative Ichiyama and Representative Val Okimoto um, appearing um, via video, video audio Zoom. Um, thank you for your patience all. There has been some difficulties here at the Capitol with uh, traffic um, delaying some of our members. So that's why Representatives Ichiyama and Representatives Okimoto at this time are only by audio Zoom. They will be coming in and just to let you know, they will be entering um, into the um, committee room um, when they do get to the Capitol. We have a full agenda members. Um, today with us, we have Chair Suzanne Case, Land Administrator Russell Suji, Assistant Administrator Kevin Moore, and Special Projects Coordinator Ian Hirokawa, all from the Department of Land and Natural Resources. To continue with our um, testimony and witnesses for um, this investigative committee. So to start off with, before we begin the presentation by DLNR, if we could have all the um, members who will be providing testimony today, please stand. Chair Suzanne Case, Land Administrator Russell Suji, Assistant Administrator Kevin Moore, and Special Projects Ian Hiro, Special Projects Coordinator Ian Hirokawa, do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. Thank you. So, as a reminder, this is um, a investigative committee hearing where testimony is being taken under oath as you've just sworn and affirmed. Um, this is in fact going to be probably one of the first hearings that we will have representatives from the DLNR present. I wanna thank your staff, um, Chair Case, for providing us with um, numerous documents. And I know it's difficult and sometimes it's difficult to find and make sure that the committee has all the documents it's requesting. So I thank you for your cooperation. And I know that we will be uh, potentially requesting more documents and then again, recalling you. But this is the opportunity um, for the department at this point in time to offer its opening statement, its opening presentation of what um, your response was to this audit as well as um, what the department has done since the findings and recommendations of this audit have been issued. Um, following your presentation, we will take a short break and then we will return for questions um, by the committee members. My hope is that this will go to 11 a.m., but we do have the time extended to 12 noon. Um, so uh, there have been uh, many questions brewing about this uh, audit. So um, for, uh, to indulge us, um, you know, if we have to go to 12 noon, I will try to keep make sure that we can um, get you folks out of here at noon. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Chair Case for your presentation. Chair Case. Thank you uh, very much, Chair Albalati and um, Vice Chair Ichiyama and uh, investigating committee members. Uh, we, appreciate, we appreciate the opportunity to testify on DLNR's response to audit 19-12. Um, you did uh, briefly mention our team, but we have our, uh, with me our land division, DLNR land division administrator, Russell Suji. We have our assistant administrator for land division, Kevin Moore. We have our special projects coordinator, Ian Hirokawa. We also have our deputy AGs, deputy, deputies AG, Linda Chow and Melissa Goldman. Um, and so I'm going to give you an overview of the land division management of income properties and then run through our responses. I would just like to start off though by clarifying a couple of points quickly that were raised yesterday. We can ask about them later if you want. But again, foremost, the audit did not identify any financial mismanagement or a violation of any statute or administrative rule. And uh, so just on the comments you heard yesterday, we maximize revenues by charging appraised fair market value per statute for all of our leases as appropriate and by keeping good tenants. Transparency is provided in Beal and our Sunshine meetings with public testimony on each item. Many of the original leases uh, back from back in the 60s had a form that did not allow DLNR to participate in sublease rent. 
So we update the lease forms to include that kind of provision when we have opportunities. And Act 219 that the legislature passed gave DLNR the specific authority to update those provisions in hotel leases, but not for other types of leases uh, when we're doing extensions. Um, DLNR does reconcile cash receipts. We track percentage rent, we track collections, we do closeout inspections. DLNR reports the special land and development fund transfers to other divisions annually to the legislature. The transfers and, our, and expenditures are authorized by the legislature in the budget each year. All non-general fund reports are on the DLNR website. DLNR also responds to any further requests uh, for information from the legislature to ensure uh, full, full transparency. We did not see the recommendations uh, until the audit was finalized, so we weren't able to comment on those. It's, it was a very odd procedure, but we uh, subsequently responded in writing to the findings in 2019, and then the auditor did request a status update in 2020, and we responded timely to that. And then the auditor did request uh, an, another update in 2021, July 1, and we responded to that at the end of July. So we're going to outline today our responses to those recommendations. So I just want to share screen if I may. All right, let's go. All right, so first we're going to provide an overview of the uh, land division and the audit, uh, our, our portfolio, and also uh, some of the, the general responses to the audit findings. So as, as the land division, uh, the structure, the land division is one of about a dozen DLNR divisions. The land division has a central administration based in Honolulu and four county districts. We have a staffing of 41, including the administrative uh, part of it and the land agents. Their duties and responsibilities are leases, revocable permits, easements, rights of entry, compliance, and land acquisition and a lot of uh, management of vacant lands as well. Our funding in the land division is entirely funded by the Special Land and Development Fund. The land disposition process is basically we follow the statutory authorization. Then we have a tenant application of some sort. The land division reviews that and recommends to the Board of Land and Natural Resources an action in the submittal. And the land board decision is made in a sunshine meeting with full public testimony. Just a bit about the public trust. So it's uh, um, set in the constitution for the benefit of future, present and future generations, the state and its political subdivisions shall conserve and protect Hawaii's natural beauty and all natural resources, including land, water, air, minerals, and energy sources and shall promote the development and utilization of those resources in a manner consistent with their conservation and in furtherance of the self-sufficiency of the state. So that's our overarching principle. Now, just to make, uh, just to clarify, there's really two versions of this. One is the public trust for natural, for public natural resources and cultural resources. Uh, as, as stated in the Waiholi decision, all public natural resources, including land are held in trust by the state for the benefit of the people. There's also the public land trust for ceded lands management, which you'll find under section 5F of the Admission Act. The ceded lands were transferred to the state in trust for five purposes, public education, betterment of the conditions of native Hawaiians, development of farm and home ownership, 
public improvements, and provision of funds for public use. And in, the, in this way, way the, the law applies a balancing test that weighs the requirements of conservation and protection of public natural resources against the development and utilization of these resources in a manner consistent with their conservation. So this is always a judgment call of, of uh, an assessment of what the condition is and, um, and a, a careful weighing and balancing. The land division portfolio consists of government lands that are not already set aside for public purposes to other agencies. So there are lots of lands already set aside. So when we got all of the lands as a territory and then a state, public purposes were uh, divvied up uh, over the last century plus. And so DOT has some, Department of Education, DHHL has its own set, University of Hawaii, um, so there's lot of counties. So what DLNR holds is even though if you, if you look it up, it says DLNR is the title holder, it's under executive order to these other agencies. So what we actually manage is not those other lands at all. We, we manage only what's left after these other public purposes have been claimed and the land has been uh, set, set aside to those agencies. So we're talking here about commercial and industrial lands in that portfolio. Uh, we'll provide some examples of income generating property. There's a lot of other land in the portfolio that is not suitable for income generation. Um, that it's, it's, it's what I sometimes refer to as the leftovers. It's, it's land that has not been claimed for other uh, public use um, or private income generation. Um, so it might be remnant parcels, small parcels that are, that are, that are just, um, um, sort of random, um, there, there might be ditches that are surrounded by public or private property, old railroad rights of way, a lot of slopes, a lot of uh, land that's in the conservation district on the side of the mountains, but it's not um, set aside to the forestry for forest and wildlife and it's got rock balls on it. Um, so a, a lot of that kind of land is under the portfolio of the land division. Now, um, Actually, only a fraction of land re revenues come from ceded lands. There's uh, significant lands that are not ceded lands that are in the land division portfolio. Maybe they were acquired uh, at a later date, and so they're not part of the original ceded lands of the state. So over 50% of the revenues in the Special Land and Development Fund are from non-ceded lands. So SEBA, the Sand Island Business and Industrial Park, is one example. Westridge Mall is another example. So that's relevant, particularly when you're assessing um, people's evaluations of the ceded land revenues that are going to OHA. The whole income portfolio is not ceded land revenue portfolio, so I have to carve that out. So just some examples here. These are um, some, some prime examples of income generating pro property that are in the portfolio. So let me just run through examples of these. Our, our best revenue source uh, is Sand Island Business and Industrial Park. Um, and so uh, this accounts for about uh, half of the revenue in the land fund comes from this fund. So it's a very critical one for the stability of certainly DLNR and government, as well as the tenants. Banyan Drive, you've heard a lot about that. Um, the, this is in Hilo with the, the hotels that were built in the uh, about the 60s, and uh, several of them, the, the Nani Loa and the Hilo Hawaii and the Land Division has worked very hard with the tenants to, um, to, to lease them and for the tenants to do refinancing and renovations. And so those two are in very good shape now. And there are uh, several others that are really run down. They're really teardowns at this point. Uncle Billy's, we had to close under uh, Hawaii County Fire Department order a couple of years ago. And so we are going through um, extensive processes to try to redevelop those. Um, the biggest challenge is the cost to either tear down or, or renovate. So it, 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 it does, that's a very big capital cost and we're trying to do that suitably with the private sector. The Kanoe Lehua industrial area is a critical part of the East Hawaii economy that was uh, initially redeveloped 
or developed uh, in, after the tsunami uh, took out the town of Waikia. Most of the tenants are locally owned businesses. So really important, stable economic situation. Puna Geothermal provides a considerable revenue when it's fully operational for the state and a portion for the county and a portion uh, for OHA revenues. The state in this case owns the minerals and that's what we, we, we lease out. Kaheava Wind Farm is an example of a non-urban uh, but income generating property that is renewable energy critical for both uh, our sustainable energy portfolio and statewide and revenue. The Milltown lots in Waipahu are a very interesting example of, of a property that is, uh, has good potential to be income generating property, but it's got a lot of challenges, particularly with the public auction process. And there have been several attempts to, um, to let it out by public auction and, uh, and, not, and no interest. Uh, because of the complications of certainly the public auction process and also that it's long term, that it's leasehold property and not fee property. The Pulehu Nui Industrial and, and Business Park in central Maui is a multi agency regional planned development that we are working on with uh, DAGS and DHHL. East Kapolei is a transit-oriented development project adjacent to the UH West Oahu campus and rail station. The whole area will have mixed-use commercial, retail, hotel, office, and light industrial and affordable housing components. And DLNR has jurisdiction over several parcels. And so we are working cooperatively with the other landowners and government agencies to, to develop this as part of the TOD in that area. A little bit about our revocable permits in our portfolio. We have about 340 revocable permits. The rents have been updated significantly in recent years, first by a CPI increase adjustment that we did as an interim measure and then by appraisal. In 1919, the re RP revenue um, that, that the uh, auditor's report cited was 2.044 million, 2,044,000. And in 2021, we did a report in July. This is now close to 2.6 million. So that's been over a 25% increase just in the last couple of years. We have a lot of uh, challenging properties um, as do uh, private landowners and other agencies. In this case, this is these are properties in Mapunapuna that are now flooding due to sea level rise. This is a real problem for the tenant and for the value of the property. Ohukaina in Kaka'ako is a good example of dealing our collaboration with other agencies who have uh, other uh, priorities and uh, development capabilities. Here, uh, HHFDC and Department of Education for multiple public purposes, particularly affordable housing and schools and revenue generation. All right, now we'll just... Uh, go through the findings for a bit. Yesterday, the auditor went through the findings, but he kind of dismissed the actual recommendations in the report and DLNR's responses. The auditor simply said, we didn't find DLNR's response to be meaningful. So we're gonna go through those responses because you, you asked for an update of where we are in response to the audit. So um, we will go through both the findings and the recommendations um, and give you the status. Okay, the first finding was that DLNR did not have a strategic plan. Without a, a strategic plan for its public lands, the land division's management of leases and revocable permits defaults to maintaining the status quo rather than exploring opportunities for higher and better uses. And I, uh, our, our response is that the land division already engages in quite a bit of strategic planning for specific projects and regional planning for the highest priority projects. We also do annual review of all local permits and we are prepared to expand our planning efforts. So, uh, but we are going ahead with developing a broader strategic plan as um, recommended by the audit. I just wanna mention, because I like to mention this at every opportunity, but we have a terrific system for uh, tracking our inventory and 
and it's uh, it also tracks the inventory of other uh, public and public agencies in the public land trust information system. And uh, uh, some of the legislatures will know legislators will know uh, from meetings that I have actually walked through. You know how you log on um, and create an account, and then you can basically look up the status of any parcel, including the status of the dip disposition of any parcel. Uh, so this is plts.hawaii.gov. We developed it in the land division for management of land division assets, but it was such a good system that we decided to go through a whole extra step to make this available to the general public. So anyone can log on to the system. Anyone can identify any piece of property and uh, track what the status is, who actually has jurisdiction of it. It's a very, very handy tool. Finding number two by the auditor was that lack of complete and coherent policies and procedures prevents the land division from adequately managing its leases and revocable permits. Our response is that the land division has a 308 page procedures manual that covers a lot of the uh, pretty routine land disposition uh, procedures. And we are updating this with additional procedures for key tasks like ensuring leasehold improvements are made in the manner approved by the board. So this is an ongoing process to update, but we have for a long time had a pretty thorough, thorough manual in place. The third finding is uh, has to do with, with the special land and development fund accountability. The auditor's finding was that lack of transparency and accountability hinders the administration of the special land and development fund. The deal on our response is, first of all, that the ceded land revenues um, from the Special Land and Development Fund are dispersed to OHA as uh, provided in, by law. So there's a complicated procedure that we uh, follow to, to track which are the ceded land revenues, and, um, and then the allocation to OHA is set in statute by the legislature. The actual expenditures by DLNR from the Special Land and Development Fund, and as you know, the strong encouragement is for DLNR to um, basically make money to fund its operations. And so that's what we try to do. And, and there are um, expenditures that are transferred to other divisions within DLNR to, to carry out their public purposes. These are all authorized by the legislature each year in the budget, and they're also reported to the legislature annually. Okay, I'm gonna go on to the audit recommendations. And there's there's three categories that are a little, it's a little confusing, so I just wanna outline what they are. First was audit recommendations to the Board of Land and Natural Resources. The second was audit recommendations to the DLNR Land Division. And the third is audit recommendations to deal on our generally. And then, uh, so let me go, just go through, through these. First uh, was that we should do tra provide training for land board members about fiduciary responsibilities and obligations as trustees, particularly as with, with regard to the public trust. So, uh, we have, since 2014, provided detailed board briefings on all of the work of the divisions. We've also provided individual division briefings to land board members. All of the land board members have taken Native Hawaiian law training at UH, including extensive discussion of the public trust. And many of them, including myself, have taken that more than once. They've all taken the required ethics training. Whenever a board submittal a uh, submittal goes from the land division or the other uh, divisions to the board uh, to make a proposal for, uh, for uh, requesting approval. The, the um, basis, uh, legal basis for that action is outlined in the submittal. And then we also have attorneys general, um, deputies, deputy attorneys general um, guiding every board meeting and also in executive session which we uh, go into when we need legal advice on the obligations and responsibilities of the land board members. Current land board members are quite experienced on BLNR and on other boards. Um, and, uh, but, but we are going to, we are going ahead with outlining formal training for new board members. We have a couple of uh, new board members 
um, one that just came on. We have some, some openings coming up. So we are uh, developing that now for new board members. The board recommendation number two, the second recommendation to the board was for a development of a long range asset management plan. So as far as the board goes, uh, the land division did an informational briefing to the board in June, 2021 on the status of that, which I'll touch on in the next session section. And then various actions, the land division has contracted with board approval for an assessment to identify further development potential of uh, select urban district properties. And then with regard to East Kapolei, the board approved the strategic development plan and the contract for the Kapolei EIS and also approved the acceptance of the Pulehu Nui EIS. So those are all planning documents that the board is significantly engaged in. All right, now the next section was the audit recommendations to the land division. So again, first the land division was to develop a strategic and long range asset management plan. So the current status is we have now hired a professional planner and we have a draft plan under review that was outlined and presented to the board in June, 2021, just a couple months ago. And again, the land division has contracted for an assessment of certain other properties to see what the development potential of those other properties is. Again, uh, examples of planning already in place for our highest priority projects. So these are these are documents from these are pages from the planning documents for um, I think in this case, Lehu Nui and East Kapolei. Okay, the second uh, uh, second general recommendation of the auditor to the land division was for policies and procedures. And so there's several parts to this. So the first part is policies and procedures for monitoring leases and revocable permits. Now the land division has a goal to formally inspect properties at least every two years. And we have a standard inspection form. And then we have internal systems for monitoring uh, rent and insurance. And we have, we were working off the SLIM system and we are now working off the Voyager system. So we are um, converting all of those processes to the new system. Uh, and then the land agents frequently do opportunistic checks and also respond to complaints. Recommendation number two. The second policies and procedures recommendation was those for reviewing the revocable permit rents. So the land division did an appraisal in 2018 and then made adjustments based on that appraisal and other uh, factors, uh, information available, made rent adjustment recommendations to the land board, which approved them in 2019 and 2020. We did not make any increases in 2021 because of the COVID-19 economic crisis, that was presented to the board and the board uh, concurred with that recommendation. But overall, the, the total RP revenue has increased over 25%, as I said, since the audit. Uh, the third policies and procedures recommendation was for verifying that improvements that were required to remain, to be made are actually made. And so this is, I, I, I would say a combination of a policy and procedure in place. And we've also implemented, we, we're reminding our land agents to conduct these follow-up inspections of finished improvements. The fourth is for rent, rent, rent collection. And we do already have procedures in place. And again, we're updating them from SLIMS to Voyager. The third recommendation to the land division by the auditor was for inspection guidelines and particularly to do a workload analysis to see if we needed additional resources in order to meet this goal of formal inspections at least once every two years. We have a written procedure in process and we did do a workload analysis for biennial inspections and the conclusion was we need at least seven additional land agents plus the operating funds for equipment and office space. And we would need a corresponding 
ceiling increase in special land development fund to fund that. There's just a summary of the workload analysis and uh, where we would have um, staffing needs in order to meet this part of the multiple duties of the land agencies. Fourth recommendation was to do a closeout inspections. Um, and this is, this is a process that's already in place. The, uh, we have an inspection form that flags issues to watch for. And in, in accordance with the auditor recommendation, we're writing a written guideline to augment the form that we have. Um, there's our inspection form uh, and, and we're doing a corresponding guideline as, as recommended. Fifth, a land division recommendation was to contract for brokers and property managers uh, to you know, explore strategies to, for marketing and managing, which, which could include private sector um, contracting. And um, so we did contract uh, Colliers in 2019 to review the public auction process, which uh, the, the, the result was that there are considerable challenges in following the public process compared to what the private sector is able to do. Um, and so they, they, they and we uh, have outlined some suggested improvements that uh, required statutory changes. The LNR proposed a couple of bills that were passed by you. Thank you very much for these uh, in recent years. Both in 2021, we have now the ability to do rent waivers for building demolition and improvements, that's critical to, for example, the Banyan Drive situation where unless you know, we wanna come up with millions of dollars, somewhere between four and 10 million for um, demolition or redevelopment, um, we, we, we want to be able to uh, uh, work with a developer to do that, but you have to be able to finance that. So now we have the ability to calculate appropriate rent waivers to to adjust for that cost beyond one year. We had only a maximum of one year before. And uh, Act uh, 236 also passed in 2021, allows extensions uh, with building improvements. Uh, this is just an example of uh, the kind of, uh, this is Kanoi Lehua industrial area in Hilo. And so this is an example of the commercial and industrial ground leases that we manage. Okay, the recommendation number six was for DLNR land division to transition from our general role of ground leasing to doing space leasing. This is a, a big issue that uh, was raised by the auditor, um, but I will say that it's a, it's, a, it's a judgment call about what is the best approach to the portfolio you have and different property owners will have different areas where they, they focus. Our specialty is ground leasing. Space leasing is much more funding and staffing intensive. It comes with liabilities for condition of the structures, is very accounting intensive. We don't think it's appropriate for our portfolio and there are potential civil service issues. So we did not implement this. We don't agree that it's the right approach for our portfolio. Okay, the, the last category of the recommendations to DLNR was for, um, what was for recommendations to DLNR generally. And so number one was for policies for reporting the special land development funds and activities. So again, as I mentioned, these are already in place the expenditures are approved by the legislature. They're reported to the legislature annually and they're subject to the ceiling set annually. Just wanna uh, provide just a couple of examples of the DLNR uh, natural and cultural resource management that we do with the funding provided by the Special Land and Development Fund as approved by you in the budget. This is Manoa Falls. So this is an example of the Na'alaheli Trails program. It's also an example of the um, engineering division, which does rockfall mitigation, which we had to do uh, recently to ensure public safety at Monroe Falls. That was just completed in July. 
The DLNR Special Land and Development Fund fully funds the Office of Conservation and Coastal Lands, which does beach restoration, beach erosion enforcement, uh, seawall enforcement, shoreline enforcement, uh, conservation district regulation in the, along the shoreline and in the mountains. So that's all, all of that work, sea level rise work is all funded by the revenues generated by the land. Uh, many of the lifeguards in the state parks have been funded by the Special Land and Development Fund as directed by the legislature. The dam safety program in engineering is uh, funded by the Special Land and Development Fund. Doe care, significant portions of the Division of Conservation and Resources Enforcement is funded by the Special Land and Development Fund, particularly including the, the the new DLNR Doe Care Training Academy, which has been hugely successful in getting a whole new generation of very, very motivated officers in place. There, there's some accounting uh, recommendations. We don't have our fiscal managers here today, so I'll, I'll just summarize these briefly. The uh, recommendation two was review of the 400 series SLDF accounts. The issue has been addressed. The unencumbered cash balances were transferred back to the origination fund, which was the SLDF. They were made in 2019 and the counts now have zero balances. And there's about three remaining that are needed for capital, and pro, uh, capital projects. Um, the second was to reconcile famous monthly to slims, which is now Voyager and this, we, we do do this. Um, and then uh, it had, had to do with the transfers of seeded land and net revenues to the general fund, as, uh, which we do as directed um, uh, by the legislature and budget and finance. So again, we, we do do this. Um, and then a, a suggestion that for written policies on uh, collection of rent. And so this is an ongoing um, project. We partially implemented and we have documented and written procedures. Uh, sorry, this is for percentage rent. So these are just uh, two examples where we have percentage rent. That's uh, Gila Hawaiian on the left and the Olamana uh, golf course on the right. So just uh, to summarize for future needs, this is our wish list. We would like approval to hire an additional planner. We have a budget request uh, for the, the new Hawaii District Land Office facility in Hilo. I think we put it in for SLDF funds uh, uh, requested in, in the last round. So that's uh, pending, that's an open request. Financial support for the regional infrastructure development and priority projects. So we have some significant expenditures when we do these projects that we can't cover by the uh, just operating funds. So uh, the the EIS process, the, the development costs themselves, infrastructure. So we will need help with that. We do need capacity to perform inspections as determined to be the right, the right level. We do need more flexibility in the leasing process. Uh, for instance, uh, direct leasing. And uh, it would be very helpful to have statutory authority to update leases and sublease provisions in all these extensions uh, to to allow us to share in, um, in the sublease rents. That's uh, our overview and we are happy to answer questions. All right, thank you. And thank you for the um, somewhat brief presentation I'd expected longer, but let's take a, a 10 minute break. We do have to check some of the technical issues and then we'll return with questions from um, our committee members. So members will take a 10 minute break and resume at nine, uh, 56. Thank you. Recess.
convening our Tuesday, September 14th hearing of the Audit Investigative Committee. Uh, good morning to the members of the public who are watching and to our testifiers and to members who are present via video Zoom as well as in, in the hearing room. Uh, we will begin with presentation uh, questions, excuse me, from members, um, starting with uh, Chair Tarnas. But if I could request, and I know that um, Council Goodman Goldman has provided the um, PDF of the presentation, we will be placing that onto um, the committee website as that is a, considered a public document having been presented to the committee here. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Chair Tarnas. Go ahead, Chair Tarnas, you have the first question. Uh, thank you, Chair Bilotti. And thank you to the DLNR team for being here today and your presentation and responding to questions. I want to make sure that I understand uh, the uh, conclusions and recommendations from DLNR regarding the uh, additional staff that you may need to do um, inspections of leases and RPs uh, at least once every two years. You know, that was a recommendation. You did a workload analysis. I'm not quite clear how the workload analysis was developed, but the basic point I got from it was that you didn't think it was a good idea and you won't be requesting legislative approval for those additions. But in your presentation today, it sounded like uh, you would be uh, making requests for uh, additional uh, capacity. Uh, could you please explain to me what you uh, would like to do with your um, with this recommendation and whether you do intend to pursue increasing your capacity so that you can have these regular inspections of leases and RPs at least once every two years? Thank you. Yes, uh, we haven't gone through the budget process yet for this fiscal year. Um, but uh, we, we do know that we need another planner. Um, I know that the land agents are all have enormous, enormous to-do lists. Um, and that if we were, if we were to um, uh, all agree that we need to formalize a process for every two years, it would require seven new land agents. I think we can go ahead and request those um, and request the ceiling increase. Um, and, um, you know, I think that the challenge is, you know, just to do the, in, those inspections, which, you know, are obviously a good idea. Um, but we do have to balance it with, you know, whatever the capacity is, including vacancies at the time, um, and not, you know, not be taking on uh, work that, for properties that may not need us, you know, some need more frequent, some don't, some get opportuni opportunistic ones. So, I mean, I think the answer is um, yes, we need those land agents if we need to meet that standard. Real quick follow-up. Uh, with that kind of response, it sure doesn't seem like this is the priority for you. And so the legislature uh, would get that impression from sort of how you're approaching it. Like, oh, yeah, we'll do it, we'll request it, but it's really not. A it, top priority yeah, is, it, is that am i reading that correctly i mean we haven't had that uh detailed into internal discussion um i it, it's a it's what we are weighing and balancing is is you know it's basically a cost benefit approach i think we need that if we are going to meet that standard so Okay, well, well, we'll leave it at that. I mean, we have to have more discussions about this, but that cost benefit analysis sounds like it really should be done because we would really need to be convinced that this is a top priority for you before we would proceed. Um, I will uh, uh, come back to further questions later. Back to you, Chair Bilotti. Thank you, Chair Tarnas. Um, members, we do have um, representatives from the DLNR. So if you want to direct a specific question to a specific person, we have Chair Case here. Land Administrator Suji, Administrative Administrator Kevin Moore, as well as Special Projects Director Coordinator uh, Ian Hirokawa. So I just want to remind you, members, you can direct questions to other persons other than the chair. Um, with that, Minority Leader Okimoto, your turn for questioning next. I don't have any questions at this time. Thank you, Chair. Okay, Chair Kobayashi, uh, questions for you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, so. Um, I, I reiterate that it, this would have been uh, easier if we went point by point, uh, they coming out with uh, their uh, implementation and we questioning immediately after that. 
Um, but um, so I'll just uh, start with um, uh, one of the issues. I guess the um, you had uh, come with the comment, uh, Chair Case, that um, this is in regards to uh, lease extensions that uh, DLNR uh, is a public entity and uh, it can't be um, managed like a private entity in, insofar as lease extensions are, are concerned. Um, one of the documents that uh, we weren't provided, we were not provided as part of subpoena that um, we were made aware of uh, was uh, provided to uh, the chair and vice chair of the committee as well as myself was um, a report commission that uh, outlines uh, some of the uh, practices by the San Diego Port Authority, um, another public entity and um, which uh, differs greatly from uh, our lease extension procedures. Um, so, um, while you're commenting that uh, private entity processes are not addressed here, um, the same as, as public, what about other best practices for other public entities? Um, San Diego Port Authority. So I, I think what you're saying is there are examples from other agencies where, uh, where there are procedures in place that allow more flexibility. And in fact, that is true for other, um, other uh, departments in the state as well, like HHFDC, HCDA, um, even Department of Agriculture. There are other agencies that have statutory authority for more flexibility. So um, yes, we, I mean, I haven't looked at the San Diego Port Authority. I'd be interested in, in that example. And so, you know, please let me know where I can find that. Um, but yes, we're interested in examples of, um, of public agency approaches that we might uh, ask for authority to, to pursue. Thank you. So the, um, the CBRE report uh, from December 2015 that was commissioned by the, uh, your DLNR's boarding division. So uh, you should have that on file. Uh, I also have a question regarding uh, the collection of percentage rents um, uh, regarding the point that uh, you failed in many instances to monitor and collect percentage rents. So uh, we've been provided with information, again, um, uh, using the lease for Hilo Hawaiian Hotel as an example. Um, and in contrast with the, uh, uh, the lease for the, the Nani Lo Hotel. Now, the um, two quite different leases, the Hilo Hawaiian Hotel um, has a number of um, uh, what I consider uh, provisions that don't really sync with what you would see in best practices uh, for uh, leases in general, uh, especially on a percentage basis. So uh, according to this contract, the lessee pays percentage rent uh, in advance on the 12th of the month at a Hilo Hawaiian hotel um, when the revenues are earned. Uh, there are no provisions for the revenue report to be shown or any true up of these uh, that basically, um, from what I can see, uh, the revenue report requirement is just that they tell you I made this much and they sign a piece of paper. Um, also, um, if you look at HRS uh, 171-36 section six, uh, the percentage rent should include the revenues of all sub lessees. Uh, from uh, my analysis of, of this, the percentage rent um, for the sub lessees is not included for the Hilo Hawaiian Hotel. Um, it is for the Nani Law, which was uh, drafted uh, differently than for the um, Hilo Hawaiian Hotel. So given the uh, two se separate situations uh, and very different lease terms, um, it, it seems that uh, if that's not addressed and those are significant sources of percentage rent, um, are, are there plans to address the Hilo Hawaiian Hotel uh, percentage rent issues. Uh, good morning, Representative. So, the, um, please identify who you are, just so that we have okay, a clear so record. The, this is uh, Kevin Moore, I'm the Assistant Administrator for the Land Division. Um, and you're right; there, there is a difference between the Hilo Hawaii and the Nanilo lease, and it's basically by oversight that the 
details on the revenue reporting did not make it into the Euro Hawaiian lease. And so as a it's kind of interim fix, the, the lessee is following the non Euro lease template. Um, and we have a plan to take the Euro Hawaiian lease back to the board for an amendment to correct that. You have a plan to do so? Yes. Okay. Um, so, I mean, you're basically taking the board to correct it, but um, so when you say you have a plan to do so, that's that's what you're going to do. Yes. I mean, there's, there's no real plan. You just take it to them, right? And yeah. ask for that uh, to be corrected. That's right. Okay. Um, uh, the other item I'd like to ask about would be uh, related to the use of uh, private brokers uh, for marketing purposes. Um, uh, there was blanket statements made regarding um, that um, you will be uh, looking into using private brokers. Again, we're provided with uh, documentation, uh, uh, the chair, the vice chair, and myself, that uh, there was actually um, uh, an analysis done in-house for the use of private brokers that um, uh, was uh, from... Uh, what it looks like is that it just was uh, rejected as something that would uh, be used. And the reasoning um, being that uh, it somehow um, would be difficult given our procurement rules. So um, this was brought up before that uh, rather than just uh, taking uh, for properties that were having a difficult time leasing uh, to the detriment of the beneficiaries, uh, rather than sticking a sign up there um, and hoping somebody sees it and rents it, that we would use some professional marketing. Um, and that's been an old issue that has been brought up that uh, according to this documentation uh, was never, uh, there was no interest in addressing this in the past. So uh, going forward, your, your comments are that uh, you are looking to use uh, brokers for, um, for marketing purposes. What, um, what changed on the procurement law from uh, when this was provide was was asked to you years ago? Uh, if I may, yes, me. Try to address that. Uh, good morning, uh, Representative Russell Suji, uh, Land Division Administrator. Uh, the procurement issue, I think, dealt with the, uh, the the procurement of real estate brokers per se, and whether you know, how to treat that under the procurement code whether it's a professional services, whether it's a sole source or small purchase agreement. Uh, aside from that though, I, what, what often comes up when you talk to these private brokers like Monroe Friedlander is uh, in the private sector, if they're representing a client, whether landlord or tenant, there is a income stream to the broker upon the successful finding of a tenant, you know, in whatever format is agreed upon by the parties, yeah, but the issue that came up in our case was because of the requirement to auction property, public auction. Uh, it is not like a private sector directly negotiated deal between landlord and tenant, and, and which then disincentivizes the, the private broker from just taking the job and going on the contingency of putting the deal together. Uh, uh, that's, I think, the distinction between procurement side as well as the, uh, the public auction requirement. Was there other issues? I'm sorry, uh, Representative. Uh, I was talking about, about marketing uh, properties that we're looking at lease. Yeah, the marketing that is required by statute is the typical publish in the newspaper. I think in this particular case, um, if we're referring to the Milltown lots, I think we went as far as to try to put it on LoopNet, if I recall correctly, Ian. Yeah. I, yes. I think it was on there. Uh, we tried auctioning at, at least twice, if not more, uh, and, and twice of it, uh, they were interested initially and, and when in those pre-bid meetings and stuff, but ultimately at the end of the day, there was no takers at the auction. And we've had that situation sometimes also in the Puna Puna as well, so a lot that we have over there. So in general, you're saying that um, on a case-by-case -case basis, you will, um, based on, um, some internal criteria, utilize uh, private brokers for auction purposes. No, he was talking about advertising, advertising on um, 
systems that LoopNet, LoopNet, which is a system that I think commercial properties are often um, marketed on, but engaging a marketing broker has a has problems from a procurement standpoint. Chair um, Kobayashi, I believe um, we're going to move on, but I think this area of uh, private brokers and marketing contracts is something that we will continue to revisit. So, so um, we'll do further follow up as well as um, just continue to cycle through the questions. But I'd like to turn now to uh, Representative Yamashita, and we'll come back to any further follow up questions you might have, Rep Kobayashi. So, Rep Yamashita, do you have any questions? And you would need to turn your camera on. Uh, I'll wait for Rep Yamashita, or otherwise I will allow Rep Peruso. Go ahead, Rep Peruso, you can ask a question. And Rep Yamashita, if you do have a question, please uh, uh, turn your camera on so that I know to call on you. Rep Peruso? Sure. So um, I do have a question about the master strategic plan. It was um, the first recommendation, and I think one of the most important um, recommendations made by the auditor was the ask for that strategic planning document. And um, I was looking for it in as part of your document production. Um, and, and I wasn't able to see it, the one, the draft that you said you submitted to the board. So if you could help me um, by um, identifying the bait stamp number and, and then so I can look at it um, for further questioning later, but uh, I'm interested in the process that was um, used to develop that master strategic plan in large part because um, if not 50%, some large part of that uh, portfolio does include seeded lands. So I am curious about the extent to which um, beneficiaries were consulted in the development of the, the master strategic plan. You're looking for the bait stamp. Um, we're, we're looking for the bait stamp number for that. The, the, the documentation that we have um, that's distributed publicly at this point is the drop is the board submittal from June 2021. Um, and so that outlines the strategic planning process in place. The opportunity for beneficiary consultations typically uh, with in testimony in the in the land board meeting as it comes up from time to time but this is you know this is we're two years into the process and we've hired a planner and we're working on it now there's not there's not a, a document that we are um, that we have presented yet Anybody? so there's an outline um, outline, uh, outline that we have presented so response from um land administrator suji and then um, we'll follow up with you, Rep. Cruz. So go ahead. Sorry, I just wanted to add that since she talked about development of properties and consultation with beneficiaries, the uh, two, two biggest property uh, projects that we're working on right now is East Kapale, the transit oriented development that is non seated land. And also, the, uh, we mentioned the Puluhinoi Maui project. And my understanding is that it's non seeded but former sugarcane lands, which DHHL will get 30% of the revenue. Okay. Thank you for that clarification, Madam Administrator. Uh, Rep. Caruso, further follow up, and then we'll turn back to um, um, Rep. Yamashita, who is in, in the room with us. Go ahead, Rep. Caruso. Yes, just uh, quickly to clarify. So, what you're saying is that um, I'll go back and look at that draft if once we identify the bait stamp number, but um, or I can go back and look at those board minutes. But um, what you're saying is uh, beneficiaries would only have a chance to testify with respect to that master strategic plan at those board hearings. There aren't any special meetings that have been planned around this development of a master strategic plan. Board meetings was the opportunity. Yes, we publish in in the agenda beforehand, and people are able to free to comment. But I was trying to address the uh, seated land issue. Great, I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, this is 
one of the deputy attorney generals, I have the bait stamp um, reference for you. We uh, weren't able to download and produce the audio. So we have a link to the audio at DLNR-LD-11879. That's the audio minutes of the meeting. And the, the submittal, the staff submittal begins at DLNR-LD-11880. Perfect, thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you, Ms. Goldman. And members of the committee will also be keeping tabs of the specific documents that members have um, uh, interest in, so as to make sure that everyone is able to see and access all of these materials. Um, Representative Yamashita, question from you. Thank, thank you, Chair. Um, my question, is, I have two questions, if that's okay. Yeah, I have two questions, if that's okay. Um, the first one is, you know, when you we're talking about your future plans for land development and things like that. And you want to come to the legislature to request positions and to request, uh, and you want to come up with a plan and things like that. One, one of the things that, um, that uh, I know you're aware of that we went through this year was we started uh, in, uh, looking into all the different special funds to see what, what kind of available excess we had. And um, one thing became very apparent with special fund because it's, um, ceiling based, it was uh, a lot less transparent for us to like dig into it for us, right? And uh, I mean, there, there, um, um, I know you're very cooperative and I appreciated that. Um, but I think going forward, because we have uh, the new enterprise financial system um, starting with under DAGs, uh, which will replace famous. Um, the, um, are you, my question is, are you in conversations with them to like um, um, implement things to be able to be more transparent with the legislature to be able to, so we can, um, when they're doing an analysis of what's going on or what the department is doing, it'll be more clear. And I think uh, going forward, um, that system will be huge for the state. So I, I, I believe conversations need to start early as to uh, what you plan to, how you plan to work with them. They are uh, impl in implementing a uh, a standard chart of accounts that all the departments will be required to, to use, um, you know, things like that. But, but, but also, it's, I think we're going to be able to dig a little deeper into detail. And um, so when the requests come in, I think it'll be uh, easier for us to um, move forward with big plans as far as, uh, you know, if you, you said it was di difficult to do space leasing. Uh, maybe, maybe we need to do that, but, but if you had a plan and it's something that uh, we could uh, put, in, put in place to be able to track, to be able to, and the legislature felt comfortable with, uh, we had things in place to be able to make sure that uh, that was something that was, that we could monitor. So my question is, sorry, so long, but my question is just that, are, are you in conversations with DAGs already as far as the new system goes? Um, thank you. Thank you for that question. I mean, we are, we are in conversations generally on the new system specific, um, and particularly the fiscal office specific to, um, making sure the statements more clearly show. I think what you want to show is the, the ceilings and expenditures versus the balances well, in the um, accounts. Well, let me um, just add that, you know, right, uh, Chair Luke has been trying to, um, Take some of the special funds and putting it into general funds and and, uh, and making it more uh, where we appropriate directly and we have more control over it and more oversight. Uh, I believe that that's what we should do yeah. um, long term. I know that we have to transition into that, but but I think the conversation needs to start early as far as working on things like that. Sure, and and there are, uh, I guess, probably every few years, um, the balances are are looked at carefully, and often there are, there are amounts taken. And, and this year, because of the extreme financial crisis, and because we had a balance above our ceiling, 
um, the uh, legislature took $10 million from the special land and development fund. Uh, so brought, brought the balance much back down, much closer to what our actual ceiling is. So but yeah, we're prepared to fully cooperate with you on, on whatever you need in order to be very clear. I mean, we are very clear that it's important that we are completely transparent with you about about that. So if we need to tweak the system so that you have the information, we're happy to work on it. Thank you. And I appreciate your cooperation with going through that process. Um, the second question is, um, is Kapolei. Um, originally, the, um, and you know, we're finding this problem, right? Trying to develop an uh, infrastructure sewer system for Pulehunui, but um, originally, um, I think with UH, uh, DHHL, um, DLNR and um, and the private developer, they all went in together to help build out the infrastructure in there for the, but uh, DLNR chose not to, is that correct? That's my record, I found that out, yes. Yeah. So I think- I think the idea you, at that time, somebody thought it was a good idea to land bank, but then we've since changed direction on that. Yes. Yeah, because I, I always thought that was a mistake, so. Yes. Well, yeah, so maybe you can explain what are you doing to like rectify that? Because I think yeah, since then you said you became aware of it. So what are you? We, well, and since then we procured a consultant to assist with a master plan. And I think recently with the help of the legislature, we got some funding for to start an EIS. Meanwhile, we've been in discussions with the surrounding landowners in particular, DR Horton, uh, in potentially, uh, and we haven't wrapped it up yet, but we are looking at a potential land swap uh, in exchange. And there is some, one of the biggest problems in that area for us right now developing is gonna be the, the water and wastewater infrastructure kind of stuff. And, and, uh, and, and Ian has been working closely with that, with our planner. And I don't know if you have any more details yeah. you can share. Oh. Uh, yes, Representative, my name, uh, Ian Hirokawa, Special Projects Coordinator. Um, to address the infrastructure, you know, the DLNR uh, sits on the TOD council and we've been working with uh, the other members and the council to develop strategies for um, more cost effective, you know, infrastructure financing proposals where we could address the regional needs, not just, you know, each agency separately. Uh, we also intend to, once we move through the EIS process and we get a, uh, a better picture of what our infrastructure requirements are, you know, we do want to work with um, the, the agencies that, you know, like UH and DHHL that actually are um, landowners, I guess, in, in the region to see, you know, where we can collaborate to, you know, resolve these needs and do it in a way that's sort of collaborative and cost effective. Yeah, I appreciate that because I think that, that um, you know, I think somebody didn't communicate it when, when that was going through it. That was a mistake, I think. But, uh, you know, going forward, that's one of the things that I've been pushing for, that it's all the departments need to communicate. And I've been trying to bring people together for that, that purpose. And, and the example it, that we're trying to follow that with Pule Right. Yeah. Thank, so. you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair Yamashita. Um, next up, we have a question from Representative Hashem. Chair Hashem, go ahead. Oh. So I guess this would be for our Russell Tsuji. You guys don't have any restrictions on recording in progress. Hello. Okay, so you guys don't have a restriction for hiring third party consultants to do a property condition assessment? Uh, property condition assessment, uh, we are we can procure that, yes. So if that's the case, why didn't you guys do that to uh, for your property all across the state? Okay, let me say this then. Uh, no, answer that question. Oh, are you withdrawing that question, Rep Hashem? No, I am asking that question. So why didn't they do that? Go ahead. Well, you're, if you're talking about properties that we actually own, 
loan and has taken back from the lessee the lease has expired kind of situation a lot of our properties are actually the land and the buildings are were put up by the lessee and they're owned by the lessee throughout the term of the lease until at the end of the term and then you need to look at the uh, the, the lease form because it, it, the older forms may not have the option or provide the option to the land board but the more current forms will provide the the board the opportunity to evaluate the building and decide whether the structure should be raised being taken down and return and the land returned to the natural condition and returned back to us or the building can stay um, and so we uh, I think one one time we we did do a building condition analysis and hire a sub consultant uh, along with our appraiser in connection with an acquisition of a uh, property that we were looking to acquire, the state was looking to acquire, uh, which is a very- Okay, simple. wait, let me interject here. Uh, so who's responsible for the structure that goes up on state land? If it's a ground lease? It's a ground lease. Uh, they, the lessee, a lot of, most of the leases, the lessee built the improvements. Yes. They're so responsible for the structure. They're responsible for maintaining the structure, right? Is that correct? Yes. And state can go in, you guys have the, the ability to go and inspect that property anytime, basically anytime you wish with, with proper notice and whatnot. Yes. Reasonable. Okay. No, that's usually in the private sector when they, nobody does their own, nobody does their own inspections. Just like you guys don't do your own appraisals. You want a third party an independent third party coming in doing an appraiser. You don't want to do an appraisal in-house. You might do it initially, but you really want a third party. Um, you want a third party opinion. So it the usually property condition assessments are done depending on the building, maybe once every five years. Once every two years is kind of too frequent. And I don't understand why you guys just don't procure it get a third party engineer that specializes in this, write it into the lease that the tenant is responsible for paying it. You guys procure it. They produce a report. The report will come out and say, this is what you need to do to maintain the property. These are the critical things that need to be done now that will fail within the next five years. Well, usually within the one, they have a short-term plan, mid-term plan and a long-term plan and with that you just throw it back to your tenant tell them this is the report you need to bring your bring your property up to code not code but up to condition based upon the report and just have the engineer go back and do a follow-up um a follow-up inspection after that that's usually what's done in the private sector there's nothing in the statute that's preventing you from doing that now I don't understand why you don't do that now. If that was the case, we would have never had that $1.5 million problem with Banyan Drive. Red, Red, Red Passion, please. Um, uh, Land Administrator Suji is trying to respond to the question. So okay. uh, Land Administrator Suji, go ahead. Statute may not prohibit, but there may, it, it'll be a lease condition that ought to have been in the lease at the time of those being issued some 65 years ago or some more recently, but yeah, that is a condition that is, we don't have right now, I would say that. So yeah, can, I, just to, can I just clarify uh, uh, the in the older leases, the, um, we, we don't have the ability to require the tenant to uh, keep, you know, remove the building if it's not in good shape, but these are, these are ground leases. I think you're right. We should look at whether we can contract these, these inspections. They're not necessarily full, full building inspections. They're com lease compliance, um, ground, mostly ground lease compliance inspections. But point well taken on looking at contracting those rather than hiring land agents to do it. Yeah, because if you hire seven people, that's about $700,000, roughly $100,000 per person running around all over the state. 
a property condition assessment is usually between five to seven thousand dollars, depending. For the Naniloa Hotel, would be considerably more, but I mean, I, I chair uh, chair Hashem, I think you've made your point, but very well take well taken. Um, I'm going to move on to questions, and we can come back to this. I think that's a fruitful area, Chair Hashem. Um, Vice Chair Uchiyama, do you have any questions? Yes, Chair. Thank you. Um, Thank you very much, Chair, uh, for your presentation and for all your staff being here today. Um, yesterday, we heard testimony from the auditor regarding the public trust doctrine, and you referenced it in your presentation today. And he seemed to imply that um, the public trust doctrine requires DLNR to maximize lease rent for industrial and commercial properties. Um, that, that seemed to be his opinion. Um, I was wondering if you would agree or disagree uh, with that with that statement. Uh, we believe our obligation is to uh, collect fair market rents as set by appraisal per statute, and uh, to um, maximize our revenues by the combination of fair market rent and good tenants. There. If you charge more than fair market rent, first of all, it's not allowed by statute. We're not allowed to collect more or less than fair market rent. And there's a whole complicated appraisal procedure. <coughs> and we want, we don't want vacancies. Um, you know, so we, if you price it out of the market, you know, it's not, and I heard some discussion about, you know, or would we be negatively influencing basically the whole the market for Hawaii people anyway, which is already very expensive. Um, but, but, but mainly we wanna make sure that those, 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 those properties are occupied with people paying fair market rent and main, maintaining the property according to the lease. Yeah. And can I add on that? Uh, in addition, the public, I believe it would be within the public trust to evaluate some urban core lands for purposes other than income generation, uh, some of it for public purpose or eleemosynary purposes. For example, we have a food basket or a food bank in industrial areas, and we provide a very, very worthy service for the public. Uh, we had a very lucrative uh, Pohu Kaina Street property that the board agreed it would be best to proceed with a multi-agency development with HHFDC for affordable housing together with DOE with a you know a state of the art or 20th century school possibly there, as well as hoping to make some revenue for the department. So there is not only the idea of maximizing revenue, but there are purposes that are allowed in our statute for the other government purposes or other public purposes. Thank you. Um, my second question is um, going back to Chair Casey's point about fair market value. Um, on page 22 of the audit, it makes a finding regarding uh, lack of appraisal staff, and that may have led to inability to reevaluate rent for revocable permits. Um, I think there was also a, a finding that was made about whether the um, land division staff that were doing appraisals um, work met the standards set out in the uniform standards of professional appraisal practice. I was wondering um, if the land division has changed its appraisal procedures uh, to address some of these findings. Well, if I may try addressing that first and then maybe my staff can add. Uh, we, and for a, a, quite a while now, we've been contracting work out for appraisal services with professional uh, approved uh, licensed appraisers, all USPAP oriented. Minimum standard is USPAP. And, um, and so we address that there. Uh, as far as uh, in-house positions, we, like I said, we've switched off and we contracted out all our appraisal services. And I can't recall when was the last time we had an appraiser, probably 14, 15, somewhere around there. There is a, um... I mean, you're, you're touching on uh, professional standards question, but certainly there's a credibility issue if we do appraisals in-house. Um, you know, appraisals get challenged um, whenever anybody thinks it's not fair, which is very frequently. 
Um, and so that's why we have a complicated procedure. But if you do it in house, you're starting up out with something that people are going to think is biased already. So that's why uh, we have uh, had the practice um, for quite a while to contract out the appraisal work. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. Thank you, Vice Chair. Um, I have a series of questions going in a different direction, and I'll turn it back to Chair Tarnas after I ask uh, this question. It's concerning um, the audit scope process. Uh, yesterday, Auditor Kondo explained that he reached out to the agency as typical of the practice and as required by Yellow Book standards to essentially have an engagement conference with um, Chair Case, you and your team. Can you explain um, that process that you engaged in and what of your team members were involved in that process? Uh, let's see, I, I, can't, I can't remember the details of the, of the first engagement, but yes, the standard practice and is, is for the auditor and his team to meet with us. So that basically would be the, at least the me and the land division people here, uh, maybe, maybe fiscal also. Um, to outline the goals of the audit um, and what the what the process is going to be, it's it's not typically a long meeting. It's just an introductory meeting, and then um, you know part of that was to outline um, interviews that follow up interviews that would be conducted, as well as document requests for document production and requests to review um, documents. So it's a it's a long it's a long period of uh, you know them asking for anything related to whatever and us uh, we produce the documents and then then they do their review based on those documents and the interviews chair uh, go ahead Russ, uh, I'm I'm sure add on that you know there was what I recall was there was a series of meetings on and I don't know which one in particular but in which Les Kondo was present and I got the sense at one of those meetings that the scope was something that I was surprising to me because it was, he gave me the impression that he was going beyond what I thought the, uh, the audit was supposed to be about, which was basically contracts, procurement kind of situation at the Special Land Development Fund as to contracts and procuring of contracts. At, at some point I realized, because I know we have a lot of contracts and we, we're doing appraisal, like I said, outside third-party appraisals for a very long time, we had third-party consultants, planners, expected them to evaluate and ask for the files for the those contracts uh, and I, I realized that they were not and they were more focused on rps and I, I asked about that and i think i think if i recall correctly mr Cohn was coming it was something to the effect that well that's within my authority and it's my decision and i'm going to do what i want to do what they are okay if i can follow up some um Mr. Suji, your understanding then was that the focus on the RPs and the um, leasing was outside of the scope and that there were other contracts that he sh because, uh, should Bill, have been looking at. So Bill talked about contracts and right? procurement. Yes. So it, from your perspective, what would have those contracts have been? And uh, Whatever contracts we procured during that time period. So that would have been definitely appraisal contracts and probably uh, the planning contracts that we had for Pule Hunoi, for East Kapole. And, uh, and I'm not sure if it was still within the time period, but we ultimately contracted uh, a special contract with CBRE for the RPs, which was, uh, we actually went through all the approvals with governor approval, et cetera. I was kind of I don't property as, property assessments for um, Kanoe Lehua and Daniel. Right, that those studies, uh, and it again not sure on the exact timing, but we also did a very big contract for an appraisal of the property we we're looking to acquire when the legislature said possibly look at a lead acquiring a lead place. So, did you in your conversation, Mr. Suji, or in these engagement interviews? ever expressed to Mr. Kondo, I think this may be out of your scope or you may be missing things within the scope of the bill that was passed. I think, I think the bill also it had language about performance audit and it was my impression that he interpreted that performance audit language as kind of a wide open authority to look at whatever he wanted. Okay. Um, 
At the point that you had these engagement conferences, was there any documentation by your office of these engagement conferences? And if you don't know, that's fine. But if that would be something that I think uh, this committee would be interested in following up on to understand uh, what were the conversations about, uh, I would appreciate that that's going to be put on a third list of documents that we would like to see. And we will issue a subpoena for that. I also would also say that if there's any conversations reported in emails, um, between different staff members, that is also something that should be produced to us. And I would urge um, that no emails or any kind of conversations around this period be um, deleted. You know, it should be kept in the course of business, but this is something that I would like to be able to have committee see. So any, um, Administrator Suji? No, I was, gonna, I was just gonna say, I, I, I'm not sure if every meeting, but certainly the auditors taped meetings. Okay, so there were taped interviews of these meetings, these yeah. even the engagement least, conference least, meetings. I, I don't know about the engagement meeting. Yeah. I think it was the interviews that, that they recorded. Okay, we'll return to that at the end of this um, procedures, but let's, um, it, I, I'm have great interest in understanding what the scope was. And if there was a difference of even the audited agency's understanding of what the scope should have been, um, that's interesting because I do think that there is clearly interest from this committee um, about appraisal contracts, about third party contracts. So the fact that this was omitted is also of concern to, to me. Um, I will uh, defer to the next set of questions. Chair Tarnas, go ahead. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I'm switching topics here uh, to cover the whole issue of uh, tracking uh, delinquent rent. Uh, with your Voyager system now, you've got policies and procedures, it sounds like you uh, now have articulated, um, perhaps uh, memorialized what you've been doing all along, but nonetheless, they are uh, written out. Are you now able to track all the delinquent rent? And if so, uh, how many accounts are delinquent? And what is the total amount of delinquent rent? And if you have to come back another time with your fiscal people, that's fine, but I am interested in knowing that. Thank you, Representative. So we do have practices in place for uh, monthly reports on the rent. Uh, I'm sorry, Kevin, could you speak into your microphone a little more closely? Yes, Thank certainly. you. Is that better? Yes. So we, we do have um, monthly reports generated that are sent to our district offices who manage the leases in their counties. Um, and those reports show, um, you know, rents that, that, that are not current. And so the uh, land, land divisions and the land agents in that district will review the report. And if the or review of the file shows the rent is not paid, then they can authorize the um, issuance of a notice of default for non-payment rent. And there's a process for that. The, um, they actually, the notices go out under chair's signature, but it's an automated system. Um, Let so me interrupt, Mr. Moore. I, I understand you, you've explained the process, which is which is good. I'm glad you've got that. I'm interested in just uh, so that we can update the information that we were provided. How many accounts are delinquent and how, what's the total amount that's delinquent just so that we can understand what the scope of this is, uh, scope of this issue is. We can follow up. We can get that information. Yeah, we can get that information. I, I don't have that. Uh, sure. Understood. Yeah, that's fine. You don't have it. And you can come back. Uh, I'd like because I think this is an important issue for this committee. Back to you, uh, Chair Pilati. Thank you, Chair Tarnas. Um, Chair Case and uh, Assistant Administrator Moore, I know that we had not actually requested a lot of the um, documents around the finances. So this will be something that we return to and that we can do further investigation on um, to acknowledge Chair Tarnas's um, line of inquiry. So up next is... Um, Minority Leader Okimoto, do you have any questions? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, quick, quick question, Chair Case. I just kind of wanted to follow up on, I think a question that Chair Vice Chair Ichiyama may have asked about. Um, if you could kind of clarify with me, if I'm not understanding this right, but from your response to Vice Chair um, Ichiyama's question about maximizing the rents, it seems that you have a different interpretation than the auditor when it comes to the definition of maximizing rents. Given that difference, how would you then explain the auditor's um, 
finding of the estimated rent losses of 1.6 million for just the 16 properties in the KIA, the KIA and other estimated rent losses contained in the auditor's report. If you could clarify that for me. Okay, so the, uh, probably one of my land folks can speak to it more, more clearly. Okay. Um, just an overview though, um, let's see. I, I think there, there was a, so number one, what Russell's point is maximizing rent is not the only goal. The goal is to get fair market rent, good tenants, a good income stream. Um, and there are other public purposes that are not revenue generating that we also pursue. There was a specific discussion about why don't you extend the leases? Why don't you um, extend, uh, cap capture um, more rent at Kanoe Lehua at the end of the leases? Can one of you want to address how, how that um, okay. yes. the maximizing rent question there? Yeah, so there's a couple of issues, but the, the big one is that. Um, the analysis the auditor went through, and that's kind of at page 11 of the audit report, assumes that we can just take over these um, buildings at the end of the lease term and immediately go out and start doing space leases for specific units. So that, that analysis is saying, hey, if you space lease these buildings out and you own them, your rents would be a lot higher. But what that doesn't look at is the cost of maintaining the building, especially doing large capital improvements to the property. Um, because as we have found, in the case of Banning Drive, for example, when, when the hotels came back to us, especially Uncle Billy's, which is vacant now, um, the cost to remediate or demolish that is very significant. And so it's just taking a very narrow look at this is the per square foot value, what you could get on a space lease applying across the board and saying, this is the rent you're not getting. Uh, the second issue on that is if you look at the leases on that page 11, as Russell alluded to earlier, one is for the food basket, which is, um, you know, a nonprofit limousinary organization. So we, the board made a decision not to charge fair market value for that ground lease. Does that answer your question? I, I'm not quite sure. Um, I, I couldn't I hear all of it as well, sorry. Sorry, what, 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 what Kevin is saying is that the calculation of the 1.6 million is just a taking the square footage of a certain amount of lease rent and applying a square footage revenue to that, but not the expense side of that equation to make those space le leases, bring them current to uh, uh, a, a good tenant property standards, maintain them, do CIP improvements, hire the staffing to do the space leasing as well. So it's a revenue, it's a space revenue generation formula, but not an expense formula. And no demand study. And no demand study. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Chair. I'll, I'll circle back to that if I if I need to. Thank I, you, I think Chair. You might look at it as a gross revenue estimate rather than a net revenue estimate, for example. Okay. okay thank you, Chair Case. Uh, Representative Chair Kobayashi, um, a next question for you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just to follow up on uh, the issue that uh, Representative Okimoto had raised uh, regarding. Uh, potential revenues forfeited. Uh, we've been provided with um, documentation of a staff analysis from uh, May 2014 um, uh, called uh, KIAA, Potential Revenues Forfeited, just dealing with that particular property, um, done by a, a staff member with 30 years of uh, commercial appraisal experience um, that um, show significant uh, detriment uh, rel relative to uh, what we could be getting. And this is based on uh, prevailing space lease rents in the Hilo area. Um, this was uh, rejected by um, apparently uh, Mr. Suji and Mr. Moore uh, without any consideration or discussion with a staff member. Um, 
and this was not provided to us as part of our our, our request in the subpoena. Um, are you? Do you recall this analysis that was done in house um, that showed a significant detriment to the beneficiaries um, by uh, accepting below market, large large below market rent? And um, I, I understand what, you, what your response was to Representative Okimoto's question as far as um, perhaps this and perhaps that, but. I mean, come on, in real life, um, you go after and you find out whether or not you can get that. It's a lot of money to leave on the table. And it's, it's not like, a, well, maybe this or that, like if we could or we couldn't. You make sure because a lot of money to leave on the table. Okay. Um, so I don't recall the particular memo or document you're, you're talking about, but um, we generally did have people in the land division around that time who were, you know, kind of proposing the same thing that the auditor did, auditor did in the report, which is that we could generate more revenue by doing space leases, but it kind of goes back to the answer we gave earlier. Um, the space leasing doesn't factor in the costs of, of maintaining these buildings. It doesn't factor in the, the cost of training additional land agents, getting them on staff to do space leases to get our operations um, you know, to perform that function because we have to then so for decades be a grand, ground lease. And if I, if I may ask, I, I think they may have been in connection with the extensions. Is that right? That's correct. Do you recall that, uh, Mr. Suji, the analysis from 2015? This would have been 14. It would have been probably the 10-year extension going from 55 to 65, which the legislature authorized. And these extensions were, uh, these extensions were being applied for by the, by the tenants, asking for an additional 10 years. And the process is to take that to the landlord for consideration. Um, we did. Or expressed its opinion uh, in, in part about following the legislative uh, authority granted in, in allowing for the, legis uh, the legislation, legislatively authorized extensions of 10 years at that time. Subsequent to that, the legislature also passed another bill to allow for further extensions beyond 65, 65 years, which then had the requirement of a specific requirement of requiring a uh, substantial improvements about a certain percentage of the per market value of the, the building, as well as a development agreement, and, and all of that package needed to be brought before the board for consideration. So um, the fact that legislature passed legislation saying you can do 65 years, uh, we're clearly not telling you to do it. I mean, if, if it's economically feasible, you could, but I've heard this answer before that, uh, well, we did it because the legislators said we, legislators said we could. Us saying you can and you have to is completely different. I mean, I think it's, it's not hard to figure out that if we say you can do 65 years, you don't have to do it. I mean, if it's economically beneficial to the beneficiaries, I think you would, but okay, um, you. we're saying that uh, you you have to, and to say that you did 65 years uh, without any other um, documentation supporting why that's economically advantageous to the state of Hawaii and its beneficiaries, it, it really doesn't hold water. Chair, Chair Kobayashi, I, I believe Chair Case may want to respond or no yeah. to your comment, and then I'd like to follow up with a question, Chair Kobayashi. Okay. Um, when the legislature authorizes something that's clearly an expression of a, of a direction, you're, you're right. Our responsibility on the staff level and certainly on the board level is to um, assess each situation and determine what is in the best interest of the state. So then we go back to what is the realistic um, estimate of what you could get converting from ground leasing, a ground leasing strategy to a space leasing strategy, calculating in potential revenues, um, statutory restrictions, um, um, cost, cost to maintain versus the, um, the benefit of continuing a solid income stream from an existing tenant and the benefit to 
in this case, the Hilo, the Hilo East Hawaii economic um, um, stability and, and well-being. And um, so there are a lot of considerations. They are, they are carefully considered when they come to the board. I, I absolutely agree with you that um, it's, not, it's not a mandate. It's, a, it's, a, it's an authorization and an expression of a, of a of uh, uh, legislative uh, in, encouragement that we we um, pursue these when they're in the best interest of the state. They are carefully evaluated at the board level when the submittal comes in. Okay, so Chair Kobayashi, thank you for your question. Let me just make a comment, and then I'll allow you one further follow up in this area. As um, Chair Kobayashi has indicated clearly, there has been some discussion uh, within your own shop about the different ways to approach leases. So um, for further discovery of this committee, any memos and staff memos concerning this issue of leasing and the different directions that may have been considered that were then submitted to the board. Um, if that has not yet been provided, we will be following up with those kinds of staff um, submittals because that is directly on point to this question of policy that is um, being pursued at least by this house with indication of, of, of wanting to move towards a different type of leasing to in fact ensure that we have um, and are getting the best benefit for, for, the, for the public as a whole. Um, with that comment, I will turn it back over, but so uh, that's gonna be added to our list um, to our staff, HNSO staff, as well as attorneys, that will be something that will be added to our list for uh, further discovery. So Chair Kobayashi, any further questions on this particular area? I'll, let you I'll allow you indulge you with one follow-up and then I do wanna to move to the next person after you. Go ahead. Thank you for indulging me, Chair. So um, I, uh, if I got one more, I guess so we'll look at it at kind of a high level uh, policy issue that um, um, time and again, uh, we hear, um, this is with respect to the question of income maximization, for properties uh, that are ceded lands that are classified as income producing by you. So um, that um, what we hear time and again is that uh, the lease extensions are issued in accordance with section 171-36. Um, but, um, and I, I, you can't dispute that. I mean, that is correct that it is um, done in accordance with uh, section 130, 171, but, um, there, there's a basic smell test and a fiduciary duty uh, that um, I would think um, you should also be cognizant of. And um, really, um, it goes to the Admissions Act, right? If you look to uh, 5F of the Admissions Act, um, the beneficiaries of ceded lands, uh, public schools, uh, Native Hawaiians, uh, home and farm ownership, uh, should also be considered. And uh, based on the documentation I see, um, the, the, the uh, response have always been that you're in accordance with the law, but I don't see um, any where places addressed for your general fiduciary responsibility with respect to ceded lands. Um, so uh, representative, we, we can provide lots of examples if you are interested in um, Board right. submittals for executive orders for um, set asides to other agencies for affordable housing, education, uh, easements for uh, transportation. Um, and, and just historically, again, what happened was, you know, a, a lot of the land was, was uh, divvied up for those various public purposes. For example, there were ac actually very large um, uh, giveaways or sales of ceded lands for housing. For example, Palolo is is, a, is an example of it used to, it was ceded lands. I think it was ceded, it was uh, um, land that, that came with the territory and was, um, it's not even leased out long-term by the state. It was given away back in the early, early days. So there were lots of, uh, lots of public lands um, set aside for, for all of those public purposes. Um, the remainder is 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 under the uh, jurisdiction of the land division still, but we regularly get requests, you know, for a county beach park or a, or a county mental health facility or whatever, and so we process those. 
um, generally as set asides. We don't we don't manage them ourselves. We we process them as set asides. So um, maybe maybe my question wasn't clear. Uh, I'll just boil it down to you that um, in addition to your obligations under state law, um, do you also recognize your fiduciary responsibility for income producing properties only to the beneficiaries? I, I didn't really get yes. that from the answer. Yes. yes. Okay. okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair Case. Um, Representative Yamashita, any further questions? Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Um, along the uh, line of questioning that uh, Chair Bilotti had earlier and uh, Suji, you um, made a comment where you said that they went into areas that uh, you thought were uh, not part of the audit or not part of the uh, legislation that was being asked of. Um, I'm just curious. On the flip side of that, were, thing, were there things that um, your department prepared to answer or to look into that uh, the auditor did not look into? Meaning the contracts. Meaning when they went through the audit, was there, was there anything that you thought, and I know this is an unorthodox type of question, but I think it's pertinent. Um, was there any um, thing that you thought was in the legislation that they were gonna audit or at least talk to you about that was not brought up? The contracts? Yeah. The contract, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. I, mean, I thought that as I have the bill, I review it, I even reviewed it before coming here and it, it talked about contracts and procurement. So I thought that was the focus of at least the, the bill but also I understood Mr. Konda believed that he had that authority to expand the scope and he decided to take the audit in that direction of RPs and some leases. Yeah. So I don't, I don't believe they asked to see many of our contract files during that time, during that time period, perhaps a few. Um. Was there any reason why you think they did it? And why they focused on what they did focus? Well, well, for let's start with why didn't they ask? What do you think? Or you don't know. I, I just, I just, I don't know. Okay. I don't know. And I, I just decide, I just thought that they decided to focus their energies on a particular area that they thought was worthy of their investigation or audit. So it's your opinion that they had um, already had a motive or a plan other than what the legislat uh, legislation described? I think you could say that. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, Representative Prusa, next question. Sure, my first question is pretty straightforward. So um, when you're talking about the revocable permits uh, in the presentation, um, you mentioned an increase in those rent revenues um, from 2019 uh, to 2021 as being an increase from about 2 million to about 2.6 million, is that correct? Yes. Okay, so, and then I'm wondering if you attribute that increase to your response to the auditors um, evaluation and findings. Yes. Okay, thank you. And then the second question is a little bit more complicated because I think it goes to um, uh, Rep Kobayashi's conversation around uh, seeded lands. And so I see two problems surrounding the discussion of the property management of those seeded Sorry, lands. Can I, can I just clarify? Uh, yeah. we, we also, you know, in 2016, we had a revocable permit task force that looked at it very carefully. And so um, there, we, had, uh, we had procedures in place and initiated before the auditor's report um, to, for example, part of, part of our process to update rents was to institute a CIP increase until we could get an appraisal. And I think the appraisal, actually we contracted the appraisal before the audit. So, um, you know, so we, we did have quite a few activities in place to 
uh, try to increase the rent um, um, that that were that preceded the audit. Okay, that's helpful. And then also, I guess just to follow up on that uh, response, did you also prior to the audit have um, a process in place to develop a master strategic plan? No, we had a lot of planning in process, but, but something, called, comp, something called an asset management plan or a strategic right. plan. No, we did not have that in process. Okay, thank you. Um, so back to my second question, which is about the problems that I see with surrounding the seeded lands and their management. So the first um, was alluded to um, by many of the uh, my colleagues, and that is about uh, the maximization of economic benefit and with respect to your uh, responsibilities to fulfill the 5F purposes. Um, and, and there's a conversation around the extent to which you're pursuing that um, economic benefit. But then I think for me, there's a, an additional question about lease extensions of those ceded lands, um, which uh, I, I, what I hear you saying when you talk about your formula for um, addressing those questions, it involves not just maximization of economic benefit, um, but also um, kind of maintaining the status quo, providing stability, continuing to deal with what you call uh, good renters. So is that an accurate depiction? Um, you know, we, we, we do all of those things uh, in different areas. So for example, East Kapolei and Pule Hunui is our development projects that we are taking a, a, a pro property that is really vacant. So that's not a status quo. You wanna continue in an area that has development potential. So we are absolutely pursuing that and, and maximizing the uh, income producing potential of those properties through development. We are doing that. There are others where the maximum income producing potential is to keep a good tenant at fair market value rent. And so we are doing that. And if I may point out, Chair. Um, Hold on. Um, uh, Land Administrator Suji is uh, also uh, responding just, to this. Can you speak to add, into them? Just to add on that, um, uh, again, to uh, Pule Hunue and East Kapolei properties are not seated. Yeah. And so I know. if you're looking at the industrial resort properties, primarily looking at Kanoi Lehua and Banyan Drive, uh, if you recall, the legislature passed legislation uh, for that economic, well, for a particular region in Hilo and, and China. And I understand, I think in the the uh, enabling legislation, I think one of the purposes was to, to stabilize or, or to promote the economy in that region. I think, and, and to me, uh, and I think that were, the legislature was trying to lay out the foundation of the basis for that legislation for limiting it to that region, and which provided for the extensions based on substantial improvements, appraisal, et cetera. And Banyan Drive is a good example of uh, maximizing income generating potential through redevelopment. Um, working with private uh, lessees on seeded lands. Um, just a quick follow-up question, because I, I want to make sure you understand my direction. Um, those lands have become politically very contentious um, because it is not, at least for the community, my community, it, it's not obvious that um, those leases should be extended, that that should be the default position. Um, so I want to make sure that you are kind of sensitive to that community conversation. And, and do you hear that yourself? Are, are you talking about Kanoi Lehua? No, no. I'm talking about the, the ceded lands that are under 65 year leases that. Um, yes, uh, we understand there are different viewpoints on that. We absolutely understand that. Okay. So that's a political question. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, um, Rep. Peru. So Rep. Hashem, uh, I believe he may be on the Zoom. If you're going to ask another question, uh, go ahead, Rep. Hashem. Yeah, I'm here. I have a kind of a comment um, that stems off of David Tarnas, Representative Tarnas's questions. You know, in your collection process, do you guys actually, when the, when the tenant goes into default, like past nine months, and uh, not nine months, past 90 days, 
do you guys collect it yourself or what do you what is your process for that i mean do you do you go after it yourself or do you give it out to someone else i can generally ask and my staff can add on uh russell tsuji uh in the past, we had a collection agency on board, uh, but uh, uh, for a number of years now, our attempts to procure or find a collection agency has not been successful. And okay, so, wait, no, okay. Right so, now, yeah. Wait, let me interject here, because the AG has a whole collections department. Yeah. And okay, let, I'm gonna let him respond to the question. Yeah. And then we can follow up, go ahead. And, and we've been working, yes, that's correct, a representative. And uh, since then we uh, has met with the attorney general's office and, and, and are working on a process uh, that would allow them to assist us in the collection. But a lot of it would, uh, because of the lack of a collection agency, a lot of the collection work is being directed toward the staff level. Okay, uh, Kevin, sure. did you want to add anything on that? I'm sorry. Well, I'm just going to add kind of at the front end of that process. If, if we have a lessee who goes into default, I was mentioning the monthly reports that come out, an NOD is issued, <clears throat> and we take it to the board. We, we can take it to the board for a recommendation for cancellation of the lease based on that default. That's a good vehicle to get the lessee's attention and to get the rent default cured. And then the process of what happens. If they don't cure, it becomes a collection matter like Russ is describing. Okay. Okay, Second. Chair Tynes, before you before you ask your follow-up, I have a very quick follow-up. Um, uh, Mr. Suji, you said in the past, the LNR had a collection agency process. When was the last time it had done that? Before 14? Yeah, 2013 or 2014. So it's between 2014 through the present only that you did not have a collection agency for a number of years yeah. procured procured okay so it was 2014 before chair case you came on board mm -hmm. okay thank you go ahead for, uh go ahead rep passion you can continue um, yeah the reason why i bring that up because usually in private organizations you have the collections department separate from the leasing department you probably want to separate that and giving it to the ag is probably the best route because we already have a infrastructure in place for that uh, my second question is, are you allowed to give TIs and free rent in your process right now? TIs? Uh, apologies. Tenant, improvement, tenant improvements or yes. an exchange yes. for free yes. or exchange for tenant improvements, X amount of months of free rent? Except it was just a minute. Well, we, uh, for a number of years up until going this past legislative session, the the improve, the rent credit or could, was limited to one years of fair market rent. And a lot of these ground leases didn't have, you know, it's unimproved property that had to go vertical on the building. So that was the limitation. We went in with legislation uh, just last session and thank you for Chair Tarnas and, and Senator Inoy, we were able to get that passed, uh, which allows uh, up to, uh, uh, 20 years fair market rent credit or the uh, amount of the uh, infrastructure put into the ground, whichever, uh, uh, whichever comes first, I think always less, if I remember the language, whichever comes less, was it? Yeah. Uh, okay. And that was just passed last session. Okay, Chair Hashem, any further question in this area? No. Okay, next question is up from Vice Chair Ikiyama. Thank you, Chair. Um, I wanna follow up on the report's findings on page 14 and 15 regarding the SEBA lease. Um, there were three issues that the auditor raised. Uh, one was uh, infrastructure completed in 1999, but yet to be dedicated. Has that infrastructure been dedicated? Uh, Thank you, Representative. Uh, the, we just recently took the board, uh, uh, the board submittal seeking uh, the board's approval to amend the lease to allow the tenant, SIBA, to retain the roads. And if I could explain, uh, the, this area is situated next to the uh, sewage treatment plant and abuts the state park. 
uh, and uh, there's a lot of homeless and tourist uh, homeless and theft issues in this area. So the, the tenant has asked us, and what they've implemented is that they, one of the interior, one of the roads coming in for the main drive is gated at, after a certain hour, like four o'clock, six o'clock or something like that. And they have a, one security guard posted and he patrols the park at night for security purposes. And, and, and uh, so we went to the board with that information together with what infrastructure has been dedicated so far. So the electrical has been dedicated and the uh, water, water line has been dedicated. And uh, when we, uh, and with previously the uh, SIBA, I understand was told by the county that the, as far as the dedication of the sewage, sewer lines, uh, that, that had to wait because they, at that time, SIBA was not prepared to dedicate the roads to because of the, they wanted to securitize the area. Uh, at, at, um, most recently at the suggestion of the land board, uh, I, we, Kevin and I, uh, together with SIBA, met with the county officials about the possibility of dedicating now the sewer lines uh, and, and, and holding back the roads with sufficient bonding uh, for a later dedication. Uh, and uh, we met the, with the director uh, and, it, it, and he, uh, it's being considered right now and they'd be getting back to us. So we are trying to dedicate everything with the exception of the roads to allow the tenant to securitize the area similar to what some people might call privatizing, uh, you know, these gated communities and residential areas to, for security purposes. Because a lot of these businesses are industrial type and they have heavy equipment, very expensive equipment. I can see why security is a premium out there. Thank you. Um, they also raised the question of um, free parking on the commercial center parcel. Has the rate for that um, parking been determined and is that being paid? That that is stopped, and Kevin, you want to elaborate on that? Are we addressing that issue? Uh, the, the master lease is kind of complicated on that parcel. We call lot one thirteen. It's it's part of the lease, but not really. And it gave Super the right to put his office there under some complicated circumstances. But basically, what we told the board in August was that. We think that SIBA has a right to use a portion of that lot without payment of rent because of the way the lease was drafted, but not the entire thing. And so um, while there was parking on that lot in past years, we gave notice to SIBA to stop doing that. Um, basically, it was the employees of the businesses in the park that were parking there, and SIBA wasn't making money off the parking, which is was a vacant lot that people park on. And so, but we stopped it. Um, and the same board action that Russell mentioned is uh, when we asked for the board to authorize a revocable permit, and that's most revocable permit for a portion of that lot 113 to receive use its office and for some parking. If it doesn't use the whole lot, then the rest would be so for the period at the time that SIBA was using it for parking, was there any rent paid? Not for lot 113. No. Is there a reason for that? Um, it's probably mostly um, that the, dis the district office didn't, wasn't aware of use of the, of the lot. Um, and again, because it was, was kind of, has a strange provision about the treatment of that parcel. It was supposed to have been reserved for other development that CEDA could have used a portion of it if it had been developed that way. So I think it just kind of, you know, it, it fell off the radar. Was there ever any discussion about charging back rent for the use of that area? We discussed it internally, but um, we have never proposed that to the board here. And this is my last question, Sherry. I've been going for a while. Is there a reason why it was not brought to the board? Yeah, Russell can add anything if you 
was appropriate but i think it's just because again going back to the way release is drafted that that parcel was to be treated differently from the rest of the industrial subdivision it seemed to have the right to use a portion of it without paying rent. We, we've also had discussions about leasing that parcel to SIBO. Yeah. And uh, the, the issue, as we actually went as far as to appraise it, uh, and they, uh, we went through a mediation process, and uh, that was not successful. Uh, it was like, it was, uh, the SIBO the board did not accept the, medi the proposed mediated rent. So with that, we're back where we are right now, where there is, um, they are still looking at a possible leasing of that property in connection with what was recently passed is, is uh, HB 499, the extension bill. So they are definitely evaluating that at this time, but they weren't ready to commit when we went to the board most recently on this infrastructure issue yet but they are still interested and uh, we are, as far as we, I understand. Thank you. I have a quick follow-up in this area and then I wanna switch gears um, to focus on another area. Um, quick follow-up, does that lease language that you believe hindered or created cloud, does that still exist in the SIBO lease at this point in time or was that mm -hmm. renewed? Yeah, that, that language is still in the lease. We do have a, I think when we get to the, a long-term lease fix for that lot, we will ask the board to do further amendments <clears throat> to the lease. And quite a few provisions to try to clean it up. Okay, it sounds like this master lease for this area may need a lot of cleanup. So I would urge that um, that, that be looked at. Um, I also would say that with respect to this area of the infrastructure dedication, if it's not already produced pursuant to the document, um, the SDT2, which essentially asked what has been done since the audit, if there are submittals related to this that's not included, I would also like that added. And so we will subpoena that in a third subpoena, but I do think it is covered by the second. So to the degree that you have um, documentation for that, that would be something that this committee is interested in. So I wanna um, switch gears a little bit and then I'm gonna switch back to tar uh, Tarnas and maybe we'll just go through one more round because I think that will take us up to 12, but I think we're almost near done. Uh, my question concerns something that um, uh, Auditor Kondo said yesterday that he essentially agreed that there was no findings, or indications of fraud uh, and that he had never um, informed the agency of any kind of irregularities that would have been required by Yellow Book if he had come across that in his evidence. So I just wanna confirm with you, Chair Case, and with your team, that was there was never any letters or indication from um, Mr. Kondo that there were potential irregularities that would need further in that investigation. None. Okay, thank you. On that note, um, I wanna now turn to the board training. Um, I appreciate that more board training is being done. Uh, is there specific indications or portions of the board training now that you're instituting that is going to focus on how board members disclose um, indirect interest before they make uh, any decisions or has that in the past? Let me ask that, is there any board training materials about indirect interest and how board members have to uh, disclose that? We have, we have uh regular conversations about conflicts of interest and uh, regular consultations with uh, the AGs about potential conflicts and uh, regular um, practices of board members when we come to an agenda item disclosing um, um, you know, any economic interest. Usually the board members are a little um, uh, Go, go further than is required um, by law in terms of disclosure of any of connections to, to anything with regard to a, a board matter. Uh, and, then there's, um, and then there's analysis of whether that connection requires a recusal. So whether it's an actual, actual conflict of interest that requires recusal from that matter. So that, yes, that's a, a very regular discussion um, with the AGs. Okay, and I guess maybe- And, and ethics training, and it's in the ethics training. In, in your training uh, with the ethics committee, and if you 
uh, if you don't know the answer to this, I, I, would, uh, I can wait for the answer, but is there any specific training around indirect interest? So, and, and if you can't answer, you, I'll, I'll let you I'll come back to that question at a different time. Yeah, I think it was from the, from the discussion yesterday about in, indirect interest. Um, uh, I mean, I, I, I guess maybe. Or, or is the ethics training just the general training that's typically given to boards and agencies? It's not tailored specifically to it's boards and commissions ethics training. Okay. Um, maybe this question is for Mr. Suji, since you have spanned numerous administrations. Um, what is your recollection about the training of board members about conflicts of interest around direct or indirect interest, if you can recall? I, re I recall training provided by the, the Ethics Commission staff, attorney, usually a staff attorney. As far as the department actually initiating anything more specific than that, don't recall even under the prior administrations. Okay. I mean, I, I would say that for, for, you know, what you're calling indirect, maybe, maybe something that is a relationship that might influence a board member's decision. Um, you know, that we do encourage board members um, not to be in situations where they either have a conflict of interest or an appearance of a conflict of interest. That's, it's, it's both of those. Um, and you know, certainly to analyze whether there's a technical um, conflict of interest, but we feel very strongly that you know, we need to be fair to, to everyone and not no favoritism. And so I, I, I personally uh, watch out for um, you know, any comments that look like they're not doing their duty to be impartial and in, in, in very clear compliance with the ethics laws. I appreciate that, Chair. Sure. And I'm going to let uh, Rep, uh, Administrator Suji just respond, and then we can move off of this question. I just recall, that. Chair, uh, that I have seen uh, in board meetings, all of our meetings are staffed by a Deputy Attorney General, and I have seen uh, inquiries from board members time to time uh, over the past administrations uh, asking, uh, raise, disclosing an issue or con potential conflict and asking if whether they need to recuse or not. And so, and, and that is usually res immediately responded to by the deputy attorney general. Okay, so in your experience, Administrator Suji, um, because again, you span administrations, and I think that's an important thing to remember that this is a spanning of administration, the, the scope of the, of the uh, auditor's report. Um, do you recall how often, um, board members would have recused themselves for indirect interest? It happened, it has happened, or they actually, in fact, a lot of times they would just step out of the room and just recuse and step out of the room while the matter is being taken up. It has occurred uh, more than once, at least two, three, four times I've seen it. Okay, but two, three, four times over four administrations? More than that. Okay. I, I, my memory doesn't doesn't go too far beyond. The we can also see that through the board submittal. So it would be well, it would be recorded in the board submittal. In the minutes. In the minutes. Okay. I'm sorry, the board minutes. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, not, that's enough on my questions. I'm gonna go through one more cycle. Chair Tarnas, last question for you. Thank you. I'm interested in uh, uh, statutory authority uh, for a number of things to make sure that the DLNR has the capacity to um, uh, implement these, uh, if you choose to, lease extensions. As uh, uh, Chair Kobayashi said, this is not a mandate, but it's uh, it's authorizing you. Um, do you have the statutory authority to update uh, the lease and sublease provisions in all lease extensions, or would you need additional authority to do that? No, we don't, and we do need additional authority to do that. Okay, and, and, and Chair Bellotti, I have just two real quick other questions that are same sort of line. Yes, go do ahead. Do you have the statutory authority to participate in revenue sharing from subleases? Uh, yes, for current le for current leases, but not for old leases. Only, so you only for percentage rent leases. Okay, so and so you may need additional authority for other leases. Yes. Okay, and then finally, um, 
uh, do you have statutory authority for um, uh, direct leasing? No, no. Okay. And we are proposing to come in with a bill for that issue. Okay, okay. Thank you, Chair Bilotti. Back to you. Thank you, Chair Tarnas. Uh, Minority Leader uh, Okimoto. Thank you, Chair Bilotti. I just wanted to kind of go, go back and get some clarification on my, my previous question um, on about maximizing or not maximizing rent. So, and you could correct me if I'm wrong, from my understanding, it's clear that you have expressed a different position than expressed by the auditor. So I just want to clarify that, that you disagree with the auditor's recommendations on this point and that you will not be changing your approach to issuing um, the maximization of rents versus retaining good tenants and the other considerations that um, were previously listed, or will you be imp implementing those changes? The, the auditor's recommendation basically said that because we don't have a strategic plan, we don't plan for um, space leasing as an option and therefore we're not maximizing rent. So we disagree with that. Um, to the extent that, um, you know, that it's a broad statement. It, it is a case-by-case -case analysis for each property. We believe that maximizing rent is not necessarily the same as space leasing. We pursue the best revenue generating possibility that we have. Okay. And all of our leases uh, representative is at fair market value, is required by law. Uh, the permits, by revocable permits, uh, uh, by law is allowed to be, the rent is allowed to be determined by the board considering various <coughs> factors. So that is, an appraisal is not required, but for leases, uh, value is determined by appraisal. Okay. Fair market value. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Representative Kobayashi. Okay, um, I say one more question here, but, um, Let's go to chapter 171, uh, where um, uh, as far as your compliance uh, with uh, state law. Uh, so I brought up um, the provision of the provision of 171-36 uh, regarding percentage rent. So I, I've touched on that and um, you've um, said that that is going to be reviewed as far as your procedures with rural Hawaiian hotel because that is part of compliance with section 171. And I, I, I don't think there's any doubt about that. Um, you can uh, refute that if, if you do have reasons to. Uh, section 171-10 uh, requires uh, BLNR to classify all public lands. And um, so uh, that's, uh, if you're not familiar with that, it's, it's the, t the title is class of land, uh, the board, of land and natural resources, so classify all public lands and in doing so be guided by the following classifications. Um, and they go through different examples of uh, terms of agriculture use, special livestock use, pasture use, commercial timber use, uh, data, data, data. Uh, has that been done? Yes. I, I certainly know it's partially been done. We can look into it and see if it's been fully done. Leasing, I think, I think it process. has been. In the leasing process. So the leasing process, yeah. For the leasing process, yes. So we have some agricultural leases that are specific to pasture, some intensive act. Right, that's a classification okay. that we have made. So you have a document I could look at that shows each of these properties and how they're classified in accordance with 171-36. Is that, so the answer to that is affirmative. We can look at our records and give you the documentation that we have. We will follow up um, Chair Kobayashi on that uh, set of documents. Okay. Um, so uh, going back to um, what um, you're talking about with, um, I guess the same sound might have heard over and over again of um, good tenants at uh, market rental levels. So, um, that, that's obviously uh, one of the considerations. I mean, you know, income maximization takes different forms, but um, there's value to continuity and value to a good tenant uh, as something I understand as a landlord. Now, um, the, uh, my question is regarding documentation of that process. Now, um, do we, is, there, is it documented uh, 
And if so, can it be provided to us that that calculus was being done as far as, okay, here's the current situation with tenant A, who's a good tenant for this these reasons, as well outlined. And this is the alternative uh, revenue we can look at. And um, these are our sources for um, our estimates on what alternative revenue would be available to us um, in lieu of uh, good tenant A at market. And um, what constitutes market uh, should also be supported. Um, is that something that can be provided to us for, for these lease extensions? Yeah, we, we can provide examples of discussions in the board submittals of analyses like that. Okay. Thank you. Um, oh. Representative um, Yamashita. Hey, Chair, real quick. The, um, um, my understanding you submitted some of the contracts to um, the legislature, but are there any other contracts that since you brought up contracts um, that you thought the auditor would have looked into but did not that we didn't get like I think I said earlier representative uh, I don't think they requested to see the files the procurement files for the appraisal contracts during any particular period necessarily um, with the exception of one, they may have looked at the CBRE, which is a larger contract, or we may have just provided it. Um, and like I said, contracts that were for the develop, the planning and development, whether Puluhinui, uh, Banyan, uh, East Kapole, those kind of contract files, which probably is pretty big. Yeah. And again, uh, my understanding was that the auditor made a decision to focus on what he focused on. Okay, thank you. So I'm not going to follow up that request with asking you to provide us with all the contracts that SLDF does, but what I'm going to do and ask is that a summation be provided to the committee as to what are the kinds of general contracts um, that we should have been apprised of and maybe been interested uh, or should have been audited from your perspective. So for example, what? Um, I think, you know, these appraisal contracts clearly is something that is in, uh, of interest of this group that connects directly to these properties. So a summation, it does not need to be- We can do that. Yes. Lengthy, but a summation. Thank you. Um, is that good for you, Chair? All right. Um, Representative Peruso, last question. Yeah, and uh, this is a question um, both for uh, Dr. Case and also for my chair. Um, I would like us to have an opportunity to have a conversation with the professional planner that you hired to do the master strategic plan because that figures so um, prominently in this whole discussion. Um, and maybe we can do that in October or um, further down the line. And, and maybe there will have been more discussions about that strategic plan by the board by the time we, we do come circle back to it. But um, if at all possible at our next convening, if we could have that person be in the room. Okay, uh, I'm gonna take that request up, but I would like the name of that person or that contract that's doing the strategic planning. And then we can, for purposes of um, coordinating the work of this uh, investigative committee, um, if necessary, we will follow up. And I do think that's a, it's a good uh, thing to think about Rep Perusa, but I do think we also need to figure out how to make it work into our workflow. So if the um, DLNR can provide us the name of the, of, you know, the company, just so we have that within our files, and then we can calendar as, as needed. Thank you. Any further questions, Rep Peruso? Okay, uh, Rep Hashem, last question. I actually have two. Um, what, uh, usually, how come, can you guys just go through OP instead of hiring somebody within for your strate strategic plan? because we have a whole planning department. I don't understand why you guys need an individual. Um, that's my one question. And two, um, well, you don't have to answer it now, but this is for Russell Tsuji. You know, for your Waipahu properties, the industrial property, what do you, can you give to me later on regarding what you need, what statutes that would, that we could change to have you 
lease out those properties. Okay, for that question, if that could be directed to the chair and the committee, and we'll make sure that that information gets to all of us about statutory proposals. Um, but I think that is a good question, um, Chair Hashem. And yeah, it doesn't have to be answered now. That's I'm just saying, let's work on changing that. Okay. And I'm more specific towards that Waipahu property. Thank you. So. Thank you. Um, Vice Chair Ichiyama, last question. Nope. Okay, so I will ask one last question. I want to, again, thank you for the provision of lots of documents to this committee. Um, clearly, we're going to, we're still working through many of them. I do want to comment on one of the sets of documents that we received. Um, Chair Case, we received a recorded interview uh, of you, of uh, the auditor. Can you explain the circumstances about how you were able to acquire that recorded interview? Yes, uh, I was interviewed twice. Um, and by staff uh, doing the audit. And um, they recorded the interview and they said that I could have a copy of the interview if I wanted. And I said, yes, please. And so afterwards they sent me a CD of the recorded interview, which I had in my files in my office. Um, was it ever explained to you that that was not um, something that was routine or it was, it was, uh, it, that it was, it was a routine process of being interviewed and then providing you with the copies of the interview. I, I don't, I don't recall a conversation. Okay. So it was a simple, you were asked to be interviewed. You said, yes, I would, but I would like a copy. And then they, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I do want to note that I think the report is based largely on quotes, and I would hate for any of your staff members to be misquoted. So I know you've also provided a waivers of confidentiality for this committee to have um, copies of those audio recordings, similar to how we have your audio recording, Chair Case, and I just wanna confirm. So Mr. Suji, you've signed this waiver dated uh, August 29th, and you are comfortable with the committee receiving a copy of of your report of the of the audio interview recording. Yes. Okay. Um, Mr. Moore, you as well. You've signed this, and it's dated August twenty eighth, twenty twenty one. Yes, no problem. Okay, and then uh, Mr. Hirokawa, yours is dated um, August twenty eighth, twenty twenty one. Correct. Thank okay. you. Okay, um, and then we also have on file um, uh, waivers from Mr. Barry Chung, who I believe is a land agent, one of the district land agents, Gordon C. Height, another district land agent, and Daniel Ornelas. And they have also all signed this willingly and acknowledged that they have waived their confidentiality. Thank you. Um, at this point, there's nothing further from me, but clearly there is a lot of questions and um, much work to still be done. We will be following up with a further subpoena based on um, the conversations we've had here. And so, um, uh, we won't be able to generate the subpoena right away, but uh, as we had done in the past, we will coordinate with your office so that we can ensure the timely production of those documents. Um, Chair Case, I'd like to uh, allow you a few minutes to close and then we will close this hearing at this time. I, I, we just appreciate the opportunity to um, meet, meet with you to outline our responses to the audit. And we are just very happy to answer any questions there's it's a very, very complicated area. A lot of um, a lot of staff time. A lot of uh, you know very long to do lists. Very uh, complicated procedures to go through to make sure that we are following all of our statutory requirements. A lot of hurdles that are um, that are uh, due to um, conflicting you know public priorities that allow us you know, some, some avenues and don't allow us other avenues and complicate you know, re redevelopment of some areas. But we have uh, good confidence in our team and in our approach um, to, to do the best that we can to generate income for DLNR and the state, including for OHA. And we're quite proud of that and we, um, again, we're just here to answer any questions to make sure um, everyone understands um, the questions that our, our answers to the questions that you have in particular. We appreciate everyone's questions. 
and I look forward to continuing this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Case. Uh, members, there's no further discussion. Uh, our next hearing will be uh, Monday of next week, 9 a.m., and we'll again be having the auditor come before us uh, to discuss the second audit that is the subject of this committee, um, the Agribusiness Development Corporation Audit. So at this time, members, our meeting is adjourned. Thank you.